to ensure that wind is incorporated, not at a 35 percent or 25 percent, but at a 15 percent level. If you could give us that analysis, uh, have your experts look at Denmark and tell us uh, what is different in their system uh, from ours. We would be happy to do that. Okay, that would but help my, us. My suspicion would be one of two things, Mr. Chairman. My suspicion would be that Denmark, if you look, if you look at Denmark, they have a backbone electrical system that can manage their needs uh, and, and, and use the wind resources when they're available. Right. Uh, or interconnections with other countries. Right. They have some source of power. But we could do that, too. I mean, there's no reason. I mean, the Southern sure. Company, obviously, unconstrained by PUCA, is across more and more states. And, and so, obviously, you uh, were advertising changes in laws as a way for you to interconnect and have more efficiency across state lines, right? Sure. Sure. And, of course, the more states that are included in any grid is the more likely it's the wind is blowing in some other state that's right. you know, another 500 miles away, and that's all then going to be part of this interconnected grid. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be windy in all parts of a grid no, in order to get uh, a 30 or 40 percent. Uh, it just has to be uh, windy in parts of the grid in order to kind of maintain that level of stability. And then I think statistically you'd probably wind up in a situation where it's highly unlikely to not be windy everywhere <laughs> at the same time, you know, and that probably doesn't happen very often anywhere uh, as long as the grid is interconnected and it's large enough. So I guess what I'm saying is where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, well, and, um, and it just depends upon the, oh, again, and analyzing Denmark would be great okay. because it seems to me that's what you're saying, that there's an interconnection, they can get it from other places. And, if that's possible, that would help us. Ms. Floyd. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I just want to put my venture capital hat on and to say that, you know, $2.4 billion of capital didn't go into the status quo. And so to be assured that there is money and investment going into new energy storage technologies that could be at a very large scale, uh, that there is investment going into when you talk about overall wind potential, and again, there are many technologies, we've talked a lot about wind and solar today, but um, uh, looking at wind turbines that are very efficient in moderate wind regimes, not just the very highest wind regimes. So I just want, uh, again, to remind the committee that there is new technology being developed that uh, when we invest, we expect there will be commercial product within a year or two of that investment and a lot of money going into energy storage. Thank you. Um, Mr. Foster, you had your hand up. Um. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I was going to observe that um, my state of Minnesota uh, has the distinction of being the largest uh, importer of electrical energy of any state in the country. And so we've looked at the development of the wind resources uh, in Minnesota really as an opportunity for promoting a level of homegrown energy production and energy independence, one of the themes of this committee. Uh, but the largest source of Minnesota's power has been from the Canadian Manitoba hydro system. And in my experience in talking about these issues in Minnesota, the hydro systems provide themselves really as natural energy storage uh, locations for uh, wind reserves so that when wind resources are being utilized, hydro systems can be, in a sense, turned off and the energy stored that would otherwise have passed through the hydro systems. And so it seems to me that you've got built in to an awful lot of the, the uh, energy systems in the United States already a homegrown storage facility for the uh, uh, complementary use of, of uh, hydro with wind generation. I mean, like Minnesota, New England imports electricity from another country as well, Canada, same as you. So we import. And what would be the receptivity, for example, of Minnesota to importing electricity from South Dakota if they were able to exploit their wind resources there and the transmission issues were overcome. Would that be something that was consistent with the history of importing electricity from Canada? It certainly would in our state. And I obviously understand in this debate the sensitivities that uh, states have about importing energy from other states, but that certainly has been our history of uh, producing electricity where it's cheap and where fuel sources were cheap and then importing it. The thing that I have found uh, most exciting in terms of economic development is the degree to which the growth of renewable energy really touches every state in the country. 
and every state has the potential for producing uh, its 15 percent renewables uh, on its own, which is something that didn't currently exist under our current system of electrical production, uh, my home state of Minnesota being a prime example, because until the development of efficient wind resources, we never had the capacity to generate much of our own uh, right. electrical fuel. Right. I mean, New England is not too far different there. Yeah. So I guess some states get used to importing oil and, or any energy resource, and other states get used to exporting it and don't like the idea of importing anything from anyone. But I think that's more of a personality uh, factor than it is uh, something that can't be dealt with as a market issue. The Southern Company seems to want to avoid importing any electricity into its region, but uh, the other regions get used to it <clears throat> just out of necessity. Um, and I think that's a factor as well. And, and there are always the agreements that can be worked out. We, in grammar school, at least in Boston, we have a chapter in every one of our geography books entitled Our Friends, the Canadians. <laughs> so we just learn how dependent we are going to be upon the Canadians for so many things from the early age, and we don't even give it a second thought that there's Quebec Hydro and all this natural gas coming down into our region. We kind of ex accept it as a part of our um, energy profile, huh? at least my 31 years on the committee. Uh, Mr. Reedy, can we go to the solar issue in, um, in Florida? Um, Mr. Hobson is talking about the clouds in uh, Florida and how it's not as good as uh, Arizona or New Mexico. Uh, is that true? No. No, sir. Um, the, we do have less solar resource in Florida. It's a different kind of solar resource. It's diffuse, uh, has a, a large component of diffuse energy as compared to direct sunlight, direct focused energy. But pa photovoltaic panels uh, respond very well to diffuse energy. Uh, are there we, success stories in Florida right now? Uh, there certainly are. Um, we, we do have uh, our resource, when compared to the very best in, in the in the world uh, is about 85 percent of, of the resource, uh, say, in Arizona. And Georgia is something around 83 percent. I, I don't call that limited, and I don't call that uh, um, inferior. Uh, it's, and that, that 83 percent is twice the resource in Germany, as we have discussed earlier today. So, how, so Germany is successful in deploying solar at 40 to 45 percent? Of the world's best, yes, sir. Yeah. Correct. Um, and it, it, would Arizona and New Mexico be at 100 percent and Florida and Georgia be at uh, 85, 85 three percent, something of that yeah. nature? Uh, so the, the, the success comes from the distributed nature of the So generation. they would be, in other words, they would be in the upper quintile, Florida for wind potential, I mean Absolutely. Uh, solar potential. It is the sunshine state. I, I, you know, it's, again, it's hard. I to owe see. that to Governor Christ. <laughs> see, we, we, in, in 1940, there were 16 congressmen from Massachusetts and six from Florida, 1940. We now have 10, and they have 30. And my, my grandfather was one of those immigrants. Just, I, I think they left for the weather. <laughs> Yes, sir. Sun. It might, it might not have been the sun, but that's what they all said when they were saying goodbye, uh, that they were just tired of the winters, the clouds, the snow, the rain, and they were going down to the Sunshine State. So, um, so it does seem to me that they would be in the upper quintile of a sun available, and then the technology deployed to capture it would, it seemed to me, have to be developed. It might be somewhat dissimilar from Arizona or from Germany, but uh, clearly, that's not a question. That's more a question of will than technology. Absolutely, you do agree with that. I agree with that, and I I, I think that the having the certainty is is the real measure yeah. of success. We know where we're going. And could, again, Mr. Hobson, can you, can you do, do you dispute that Florida is in the upper quintile of the country in terms of availability of sunshine? Yeah, you know, Mr. Chairman, like a I said earlier, I, 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 I want to try to draw the distinction between solar, several things I'd like to say about solar. 
One is I like to draw the distinction between the demand side use of solar versus the, gener the supply side use of solar. I think solar has great promise. Even in the southeast, we see, we see examples of it all the time of, of uh, individual applications of solar for, for uh, end use. For instance, we, we sponsored with Georgia Tech um, during the Olympics, their swimming natatorium uh, is all solar panels. Southern Company helped Georgia Tech. We funded that. It's still operating today. It's a great application. There are those kinds of applications. It just becomes a different value proposition when you're thinking about using something like solar on a large scale for the production of electricity on the supply side. It's not just, it's still things like reliability. That's no, I understand that. No, I understand these reliability questions, which uh, can I ask the, the Southern Company as well then to provide for us your analysis of the comparison between the, uh, the Southern Company and Germany in terms of their integration of solar into their grid and uh, why you couldn't do that, what the <laughs> obstacles would be for you to match Germany at a 40 percent uh, uh, solar level with, uh, with uh, uh, it seems to me, a higher level of predictability. And, uh, and guaranteed uh, source. And, no. the, the, I'm sorry, yes, sir. One other point I would say about solar that, that has to be made, and that is that we operate in a region where our customers are paying about eight cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. Um, we, we view solar in the 50 cent per kilowatt hour range. And so aside from just the technical challenges associated with solar, there are economic challenges associated with Can I go back to you again, Mr. Reedy? In, in Florida, is it 50 cents a kilowatt hour? Uh, no, sir, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, even in a one-off small applications, it's well, well below 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh -huh. In utility scale applications, uh, there's, there's analysis that supports something uh, around 11 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour in large, very large utility applications. Where, uh, could, you give, could you give Mr. Hobson an example where, of where it's under 30 cents a kilowatt hour already? Um, you might not be able, aware of in Florida. Well, throughout the markets in California and New Jersey, which is uh, pretty far north again, fair amount of clouds, uh, those are the costs that are, that are, that are being seen by installers and contractors and, and by the end user. Uh, so it's, it, we would take great issue with those figures. Um, and the technology is vastly improving and by prediction of an analysis of the Department of Energy, it's, it, it's going to be down around, um, you know, 15 cents in about five years. Is, Gov is Governor Chris um, pessimistic about solar energy in Florida? Is he aware of how cloudy it is down there? Governor Christ has a say, and he says it can be done. It can be done. And uh, he is very optimistic about it. Yeah, I do think it gets cloudy down there in Florida. 